Morning, Dr. Breen. Welcome. Hi. Sorry Thank about you. that. I no, that's okay. the computer very briefly. How are you? I'm sorry? How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Good. I need to make sure Do I can hear you here. Oh, sure. My volume a little bit louder. I can also make mine louder. Okay, I think that's good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Do you want to try to share your slides and just make sure everything is sure. out? Sure. Um, uh, go share. Are you seeing that? Great. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. We'll just wait for a few more people to come and then we'll get started. Sure. How big is the crowd usually? Um, around like 15 to 25, depending. Okay. So decent. Yeah. Well, since it's 501, Dr. Breen, we can get started and let other people sort of trickle in if that's okay with you. We are also recording this, so this will be on the YouTube later for anyone to review. All right, I'll just briefly introduce you. I know I sent a little bit in the email, um, but everyone who is listening um, and for everyone listening to this recorded, uh, this is Dr. Joseph Breen. He completed his residency actually at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine. Um, and did a fellowship in neurotology at Baylor. Um, he did spend his early faculty career at the University of Cincinnati, which is actually where I'm a medical student alumnus, and then um, is now at Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, Florida. He has many focuses, um, but one of them is specifically pulsatile tinnitus, so we're really looking forward to hearing uh, from him and kind of getting an expert opinion on that today. So thank you so much for being here, Dr. Breen. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I got connected to this group through Dr. Raymond, who um, my understanding is she kind of helped kick off this whole lecture series. She's my colleague here at Mayo in Florida, and I was happy to uh, take up the challenge when she invited me to talk to your group. So again, appreciate the invite and looking forward to talking to everybody a little bit about pulsatile tinnitus, which I will say there's some, it's a kind of a double-edged sword to put yourself out there and saying that you're interested in treating patients with this. Um, I think there's a few different diagnoses out there, whether it's CSF leaks or it's pulsatile tinnitus or, um, you know, superior canal dehiscence, where you're going to get some interesting patients coming out of the woodwork and finding you when you uh, you put out on your shingle that you're interested in treating this. But for what it's worth, I'm going to talk a little bit about my 
uh, approach to the problem, how I think about it, how I treat these patients, and uh, hopefully some insights for your practice. So we'll start with a case, uh, like any good talk. Uh, this is a 25-year-old woman who came to see me when I was in Cincinnati. She said, I know it sounds crazy, and she was literally told by other physicians that it was probably a manifestation of her bipolar disorder, but she said that she hears a whooshing in her right ear. And so this is her audiogram, looks normal. Um, her ear exam was normal. There was nothing I could auscultate over her neck. Uh, but if you put a uh, like a twin B stethoscope or a double-headed stethoscope into her ear canals, I could actually auscultate a sound in her right ear, which would diminish if you would compress the right side of her neck. So if you compress over the right jugular vein, you would diminish the sound significantly. And so I told her she may not be crazy. Well, she may actually still be crazy, but I can actually hear the sound too. So it's not all in her head. So this is a little snapshot of her CT scan showing this area of dehiscence over her right sigmoid sinus, which I thought was probably part of her problem. So I'm um, just to sort of step back and talk about tinnitus in general, you know, and your relatives who don't know anything about medicine, uh, and find out that you're an ear doctor, they probably want to talk to you about their tinnitus, which normally wouldn't get you very excited, except pulsal tinnitus is a little more exciting, I think. So objective pulse synchronous tinnitus is really more specifically what we're talking about. It's not the same thing, of course, as the ringing subjective type tinnitus that everyone wants you to find a cure for. Um, it is often treatable to the point of complete resolution with surgery, which obviously makes it very exciting to the average neurotologist. And I think it's rewarding to provide relief for a distressing symptom, especially something that some people have been um, sort of told, hey, look, this is nothing we can do anything for. This is your bipolar disorder. This is something that um, is all in your head and you just got to get over it. Um, I think it involves a little bit of detective work. So thinking about the problem, thinking about why they might be hearing a sound and how you can fix it is, I think, uh, an interesting problem to solve. And there are a lot of unknowns regarding the pathophysiology. So um, some things have been fairly well settled, uh, but things in this uh, field are evolving, and I think that makes it interesting to be a, um, a practitioner of. So background in theory, a few words to define first. Tinnitus is just the perception of sound from within the patient, meaning the sound is not external. The sound is somehow inside the patient, whether it's from their uh, cortex or from, its, uh, from a vessel near their ear, it is a sound that is within the patient. Pulsatile just means modulating in intensity or pitch. Doesn't necessarily mean it goes with their heartbeat, but it does have a pulsing up and down quality to it. Usually an intensity is what people talk about. In many cases, it's gonna be objective. So objective just means it's audible to you or a recording device of some sort. You can measure it and beyond just what the patient is reporting to you. And the stuff that we're most interested in that we can often treat is pulse synchronous. So it corresponds to the patient's pulse. You can you know, take their radial pulse while you're listening to the sound. And when you can tap on their shoulder in rhythm with the sound you're hearing, they kind of find that interesting um, and, and rewarding uh, often to, to come to a diagnosis. So this is just an unpublished quick study I did looking when I was again at Cincinnati at um, the, the TrinetX database. This is a database with uh, several different academic facilities all pooling their data together on diagnosis codes, um, medications, tests, and surgeries. And I just looked for the diagnosis code of pulsatile tinnitus, which is H93.A in the ICD-10, and just saw also patients, uh, including those who also underwent an audiogram. So I figured that would sort of hone in on the patients who are coming to see the otolaryngologist or the neurotologist. Uh, there was a significant female uh, over male breakdown, 75% to 25%. Um, most were white, but also um, uh, some unknown and some Hispanic as well. Uh, black or African-American was 17%. Uh, so, you know, close to a, a cross-section of the pathology or the patient population seen in these institutions, but not quite. So a little bit predominantly white. Um, the age range skewed with a mean age towards uh, at 56, saw people as young as four and as old as 90 coming to see the doctor with this complaint. I'm surprised a four-year-old would complain of pulsatile tinnitus, but that was in their data set apparently. Um, and what I did then was just correspond over the next five years, what diagnosis codes were likely to be ultimately entered for that patient. So 
maybe some idea of what was the etiology that was ultimately determined for that patient's pulsatile tinnitus. And so um, comparing that to matched controls, so people who also came for an audiogram but didn't have a diagnosis code of pulsatile tinnitus, um, at the bottom here we have these relative risks of uh, the diagnosis code being entered for the pulsatile tinnitus versus the non-pulsatile tinnitus patients and saw the strongest correlations with uh, IIH, not surprisingly. Um, interestingly, an intracranial aneurysm, which I don't think of people often being able to hear, but there might have been a little bit of recall bias or you know, perhaps we're going to look for these things. Some practitioners hear that, that someone can hear their pulse and so they'll go ordering an angiogram and they'll find an aneurysm and the like. Um, uh, also paragangliomas, so middle ear tumors, far more likely to be found in the pulse tinnitus patients than the matched controls. Um, and interestingly, no real correlation with migraine headache uh, or with sensorineural hearing loss. Um, no real difference either for um, have there being schwannomas, meningiomas and such. So um, I thought it was just kind of interesting to see that there is definitely an overlap with this patient and the IIH population, which probably won't surprise most of us. So I think this might be the most uh, important kind of single summary slide for um, the point I want to get across with these patients is that you have to think about why is someone hearing their pulse? Why are they hearing a pulsatile sound? I think it, a lot of it can be narrowed down if you tell the patient to describe what they are hearing to you. So if they say they're hearing a whoosh, that is probably fluid flow or turbulent flow or vibration happening near their ear. Um, but it's interesting that we have our carotid artery going within millimeters of our cochlea in the normal state. And so there's huge amounts of blood that's flowing by that ear all the time, but you don't hear the sound, probably because that flow is laminar and it's encased in blood, uh, a blood, thickened blood vessel with a thickened wall and also bone. Um, but yet, probably more frequently, we see venous side abnormalities causing an audible sound. Um, so there probably has to be a couple things going on beyond just turbulent flow. But that's one thing to key into is, does the patient tell you they hear a whooshing sound or a thumping sound? A thumping sound, I don't know, in my practice, I less frequently ultimately come to a diagnosis. And if anyone else in the crowd, any of the faculty out there have uh, come to find, you know, clear diagnoses in some of these patients, they should let me know some of their tricks because I feel like I can treat the whooshers much better than the thumpers. But if you think about what would cause that kind of sound, maybe like mass movement, so a middle ear tumor, um, or perhaps intracranial hypertension, so the pulsatile movement of an encephalus seal perhaps could cause the perception of that kind of sound or something up against the ossicles or the tympanic membrane. But more frequently, the things I see that I can actually treat cause these whooshing sounds, dehiscences of the sigmoid sinus, maybe even the carotid artery, jugular bulb, um, but also canal dehiscence, pure canal dehiscence. If people describe a pulsatile tinnitus, they usually tell me it sounds like a whooshing sound. Um, the other type of sound that people will sometimes describe is this like Morse code or typewriter type sound. What's that from? I don't know exactly, but there is some thought that it's maybe neural discharge. So actually cochlear nerve, um, you know, spiral ganglion fibers firing and that being perceived as a sound, perhaps because of neurovascular conflict. So an ICA loop up in contact with the eighth nerve, that'd be controversial, I know, to do any sort of treatment for, but that's a theory. And then also maybe middle ear musculature, so middle ear muscle spasms causing a more Morse code or clicking or popping type tinnitus. And I think it's also important to think about how would the sound be heard. So the yellow text here, those are going to be etiologies that would be conducted by air. So within the temporal bone, a dehiscent sigmoid sinus, for example, might be causing a reverberating sound within the mastoid air cells, then the middle ear. And then it hits your tympanic membrane, makes that move, and you can hear the sound. Um, conversely, superior canal dehiscence, those patients probably hear their pulse because they have enhanced bone conduction. So those sounds are probably being heard by bone conduction. And these kind of things are just things to think about when you think about how to treat it. So doing a sigmoid sinus resurfacing, which we'll talk about a bit, might be a logical way to treat an air-conducted sound. But uh, superior canal dehiscence, you know, it's going to have to be treated in a different means. The breakdown of what patients uh, diagnoses are, that's one question I was trying to answer with that, you know, unpublished Trinetics uh, query um, has been has been thought about before, of course. So Dr. Sismanis, who um, has done the pulsatile tinnitus uh, talk 
for decades probably at the academy meeting it's always uh worth a listen i encourage you to check it out this year if you haven't gone before um he's still involved in it i think um he did this study he released it in 1998 and his um diagnostic pathway which we don't really have time to fully go into he often came to intracranial hypertension as the main cause for pulsatile tinnitus um I think that that number in my practice is a little bit lower, but I think that's also because we've learned about a couple of diagnoses since 1998 that are probably a little more prevalent than were appreciated then. So namely, I think, you know, sigmoid sinus wall abnormalities, but also superior semicircular canal dehiscence. So those two you can see aren't um, represented too much on, on his uh, diagnosis breakdown table here. Um, he also did attribute a fair amount of those to atherosclerosis. So that I, thought, I think is interesting too. Carotid atherosclerosis is extremely prevalent, but pulsatile tinnitus, not so much. So there must be something beyond, I would think, just narrowing of the artery that causes a patient to be able to hear. At the same time, there's also a correlation between aging and losing higher frequency hearing. So it could be that as patients accumulate plaque in their arteries, they actually lose the ability to hear the sound that that's creating. So you can hear a brew if you put a stethoscope on their neck, but the patient themselves can't hear it because perhaps their acuity has gone down over time. And uh, he had an interesting thought of why intracranial hypertension would cause you to hear your own pulse. And so he says, it says here, the mechanism for pulsal tinnitus in these patients is probably secondary to the transmission of systolic pulsations of the CSF to the exposed medial aspect of the dural venous sinuses and the resulting periodic compression of their walls, which convert the normally laminar blood flow to turbulent. And I think there's, there's some good sense to that too, because if you've ever, I mean, I'm sure none of you have, but if you ever happen to have made a hole in the sigmoid sinus while you're doing a trans lab, or maybe a hole in the jugular vein when you're doing a neck dissection, that blood flow is not particularly pulsatile. It's just sort of a, you know, a continuous flow. It's venous and less pulsatile than, um, than you know, perhaps arterial blood flow. But yet the patients, and even you will listen to this sound in their ear, it is still a, you know, it goes from inaudible to a loud, loud and sharp sort of broadband noise sound. So there must be something about the flow being somehow, I think that makes some sense, being intermittently compressed or intermittently turbulent that maybe explains the sound uh, more than just the shape of the blood vessel or a dehiscence, for example. So this gets us thinking a little more about different etiologies, so different diagnoses we might ultimately come to. Um, so one we've been talking about, intracranial hypertension and pulsal tinnitus. I, I don't know if we have the answer to whether IIH alone is sufficient to cause pulsatal tinnitus. I have some patients who have gotten a little bit better on Diamox when they have a clear intracranial hypertension diagnosis, but no obvious uh, cause that I can treat for pulsatal tinnitus beyond that. Um, there might be some who are having some success. There's a group uh, which we'll talk a little bit at, uh, at Cornell, where they talked about doing a lot of transverse sinus stenting for this problem, mentioning some improvement in their, um, their pulsal tinnitus patients. But there's also a lot of overlap between intracranial hypertension and other things that the ear doctor would be seeing. So sigmoid sinus transverse, sigmoid and transverse sinus abnormalities, canal dehiscence, and then even CSF leaks or encephalocele's. So here's just some um, MRV um, images of sigmoid and transverse sinus abnormalities, these significantly stenotic transverse sinuses. And there's this question that gets raised by that finding of what's the chicken and what's the egg? Does that person have a narrow transverse sinus because of the pressure of their intracranial contents against the walls of the vessel? Or is the decreased lumen causing a backup of venous pressure, which ultimately leads to a backup of intracranial pressure. So which is causative of which, I don't know if we know, or do we reach some sort of steady state? So people have looked into treating this with different stents, like we talked about this group out of Cornell. Um, they saw 28 of 29 of their patients with pulsal tinnitus have their symptom resolve when they were having their intracranial hypertension treated with transverse sinus stenting. And then there's the question uh, we brought up before about carotid artery disease. Is that able to cause people to hear their pulse? I don't know. There's the, the question of um, why is it not more prevalent if, um, you know, there's, you know, literally millions probably of Americans with uh, significant atherosclerosis, but they cannot hear the sound of their blood flowing through that stenosed vessel. 
Um, there have been reports, though, of patients who underwent endarterectomy and had significant improvement in their pulsatile tinnitus. So I certainly can't um, uh, can't ignore that entirely. That's that's probably real. That's probably uh, something where if people need their um, uh, uh, carotid stenosis treated for other reasons, I you know encourage that to happen. But I don't know if I've recommended anyone to undergo an endarterectomy to treat suspected cause of pulsal tinnitus alone with no other indications. But that's my bias. Um, and then this is just showing an MRI of this question of neurovascular conflict, so causing that typewriter tinnitus. So, but we see this all the time too, right? So we see ICA loops like, uh, oops, pause it, sorry. ICA loops like right here on the left side coming into contact with the eighth nerve. And, you know, that's that's sort of the neurotologist's worst nightmare when the radiologist writes that in their report and then the patient says, come here, like, look at this, uh, there's the thing you have to treat, you got to decompress my eighth nerve. Um, and, you know, people have tried this. Um, people have um, looked into this anyway as an etiology. There have been some questions of why not the eighth nerve, neurovascular compression, a probable cause for pulsatile tinnitus. So um, in the 80s, um, Janetta and the University of Pittsburgh um, started decompressing all the cranial nerves he could find. So the one where they found the most success was, of course, uh, the trigeminal nerve. So trigeminal neuralgia, uh, vascular decompression can be a significantly um, uh, effective surgery. Now for tinnitus or postal tinnitus, there's far less data out there. There's a few case reports you might find, but people have thought about this. Um, I treat it in some cases medically. So if people described me a clicking or a typewriter type tinnitus, um, I'll try uh, carbamazepine or oxcarbazepine. So I thought this was interesting. The first mention I could find of it in the literature was in the New England Journal of Medicine, where a cardiologist, he wrote in, he says, to the editor, this is to report the experience of a 43-year-old male pediatric cardiologist, me, with a most annoying ear clicking form of tinnitus, which greatly affected my professional work and puzzled several authorities. This problem responded to treatment with carbamazepine after two middle ear operations had failed to provide relief. Um, so there have been some folks that have gone on to study this a little bit more in depth. Um, I have had some patients with um, who've reported some relief. So it's the same medication that people give for um, trigeminal neuralgia in many cases. So I think that's the idea is that we're treating the same type of um, uh, pathology. And then, so middle ear myoclonus, this is not a vascular cause, of course, and it doesn't cause a pulse synchronous tinnitus, but either the stapedius muscle or the tensor tympani muscle, um, which are innervated by the facial and trigeminal nerves, may have some sort of irritative lesion along their courses. Um, and so therefore I usually get an MRI when I get patients that are fairly convincing for middle ear myoclonus. Um, I have seen this treated successfully again without carbamazepine. Um, but you can also consider surgical management. So lysing their stapedius and tensor tympani tendons. I've gotten, I think, two patients to take me up on that. Um, and with mixed results, I think 50-50 in terms of actually having gotten better. Um, and then also, you know, you have to tell the patient, do they have to consider maybe they're going to have hyperacusis after treatment. So if they lose that reflexive protection of their inner ear by contraction of those muscles, uh, are they going to be more susceptible to noise-induced hearing loss or have hyperacusis? Um, you know, no in my N of two, but um, I guess it is a theoretical risk. So then superior canal dehiscence, um, I think, is something that's under-recognized, at least in the older literature. So if you look at um, a lot of textbook series where they talk about what's the percentage breakdown of different diagnoses that are uh, ultimately reached when it comes to pulsatile tinnitus, I think canal dehiscence is probably underrepresented in a lot of them. Um, of course, you know, Dr. Minor and the papers that were coming out in the mid to late 90s really introduced us to this concept, missing bone over the dome of the superior canal here, of course, causing a whole host of symptoms. Um, how common is it? Well, over time, as we've done more, oops, let's get this window here, um, as we've done more um, fine cut CT scans, as scans get higher and higher resolution, as we look more at this patient population, it's probably somewhere in the low single digit percentage uh, range. If you look at the histological, histological studies, they say maybe it's about a 0.5% incidence of canal dehiscence in the population. But um, 
if you look at some older papers, you know, these are from like the mid 2000s, talk about maybe a 9% incidence of superior semicircular canal dehiscence. I think that as we've gotten thinner and thinner cut CT scans, though, we think that's probably a big overcount of how frequent this problem is. But as to how often it's, uh, or how it's even causing pulsatile tinnitus, um, you know, there have been some different theories about that, but the main idea is that there's enhanced bone conduction. So there is a reduction in the impedance mismatch between inner ear fluid and the intracranial contents. So sound that's being conducted through the intracranial space is more easily able to reach the stapes foot plate or even the uh, basilar membrane and cause you to hear the sound. So you'll see it on the audiogram, of course, you'll see those supranormal bone conduction thresholds. So people who have those thresholds at minus 5, minus 10, minus 15, you know, they're hearing better than perfect uh, in the affected ear. So that should be a real tell when you see that in your patient who comes in with pulsal tinnitus and they have a small ear bone gap or a supranormal bone conduction threshold. That should really make you think about spirit canal dehiscence. Here's just a couple CT scans um, looking at canal dehiscence with our um, fancy photon counting unit, which uh, really has kind of um, changed our practice quite a bit here. The, the images you can get are just incredible. Um, and you can see this clear area here of lost bone over the superior semicircular canal. This is the partial or perpendicular view. I think this is most useful for finding out if there is a dehiscence because you sample the entire cross section of the canal here. Um, you know, if you had a little bit of bone at the superior most aspect, but it was more on the medial aspect of the canal, there was a dehiscence, you might miss it if you look just at the Stenvers view here. But the Stenvers view is more useful for telling us where along the course of the superior canal is there a dehiscence. So this one obviously a fairly uh, broad dehiscence in this patient. And this uh, slide here, I just wanted to compare. This is the same patient who came to see me um, five years after they saw my predecessor here, Dr. Larry Lundy, for superior canal dehiscence. Her symptoms were kind of changing and her audiogram was a little bit worse. So I thought we should maybe get a new scan, maybe just for academic purposes to see, well, has that dehiscence gotten bigger? Uh, we don't fully understand why this develops or if this is like a congenital thing or is it enlarged over time by intracranial pressure? And I don't know, I wasn't necessarily convinced that the dehiscence was significantly larger, but what I was convinced by was just the, you know, improvement in image quality that we've seen over that time with the photon counting unit. Um, I think there are a lot of patients where if they saw maybe eh, there's some thin bone there, um, if they had gotten a photon counting CT scan preoperatively, they probably would have discovered that you know, there more definitively was or wasn't. So. Um, this is kind of an overview slide from the Stanford group, these nice illustrations of the most common types of vascular dehiscences that will cause pulsatile tinnitus. So the sigmoid diverticulum, so an actual outcropping of the vessel, um, just a straight dehiscence of the vessel where there's bone missing and that turbulent flow leads to vibration of the wall of the sinus. And then ultimately that's heard uh, at the tympanic membrane or at the ossicles, which vibrate. Jugular bulb dehiscence here in the hypotympanum, and then also carotid dehiscence, which um, that's kind of a harder one to call, I feel like. You do see, I think, incidentally, a fair amount of carotid dehiscence, but very little symptomatic complaint um, in most patients. So um, that's maybe another question we don't, we don't have great answers to. Um, Dr. Kesser and his group at Virginia, I think, did this nice paper talking about um, uh, the incidence of sigmoid sinus dehiscence amongst the patients who came to see them with pulsatile tinnitus. So they looked at all the people who had CT scans for pulsatile tinnitus and then compared them to matched controls. And they found nine out of 37 patients had sigmoid sinus diverticulum or dehiscence versus only two of 308 um, control patients. So a less than 1% incidence of this in the population, but it seems like a strong correlation with pulsatile tinnitus. But I guess the question I have um, that uh, we don't know the answer to is exactly what is necessary for people to hear their pulse. Is just having the bone missing uh, necessary or do they also need to have abnormally turbulent flow? So something like an arachnoid granulation like they have drawn there in the transverse sinus or maybe a diverticulum or maybe um, you know just a more tortuous vessel anatomy. Is that what you need to be able to hear your pulse? And what causes the dehiscence? Is it caused by pressure over time and erosion? Is it caused by pneumonization of the temporal bone? We don't have the answers to all this. 
All right, so on to the fun part, doing surgery to help these folks. Um, the basic idea with treating sigmoid sinus dehiscence is just putting something over the dehiscence. You're not doing anything to change turbulent blood flow within the vessel, like with the sigmoid sinus denting. You're just putting more insulation over the pipe. You are making a muffler, basically, so that they will not hear the sound anymore. Um, in my hands, this has a very high success rate. Um, you can use whatever material you want. This is um, some work by Dr. Eisman out of Maryland, where he talks about a more kind of aggressive, compared to what I do, I guess, um, procedure where a lot of bone around the dehiscence is exposed and removed. The sinus might be cauterized and covered in fascia, followed by hydroxyapatite cement, and then the mastoid can be obliterated by fat. But really just anything, I think, that insulates the pipe should be effective. And there have been occasional reports of this causing sigmoid sinus thrombosis, and especially when this tends to be in the patient's dominant sinus. Um, I shy away from it a little bit just for fear of causing a clot in their dominant sinus and causing maybe their intracranial pressure to get worse. Um, some of the first groups uh, to publish some reports on this, uh, Emery, Dr. Maddox, who I think has given a talk to this group um, about this same topic. I was talking to Dr. Raymond, um, you know, talked about some early case reports of patients resolving after sigmoid sinus resurfacing. Um, Dr. Eisman's group in Maryland has a, a large experience in this. Um, that you can learn from in their papers. Um, but I wanted to share a few of my own cases just to kind of provide a few more case reports of things to look for when patients come to you with pulsal tinnitus. So this patient says, I have a thumping sound in my left ear and she had a pretty obvious abnormality on her exam. You can see on her uh, otoendoscope view here, a blush of something red in the um, you know anterior inferior quadrant, which on a CT scan that seems to line up with that being most likely a glomus tumor. Um, I think we tend to cut these all out, even though they're benign tumors, and you could probably even wash them because they're bothersome and, you know, removal lead means cure. So this isn't like a glomus jugulari tumor, which can cause pulsal tinnitus. Um, but, uh, you know, one thing that I think is very useful is to think of it as a, a debulking procedure that you can offer the patient to relieve their pulsal tinnitus or conductive hearing loss. Uh, Dr. McGarrian and his uh, colleagues out of Case Western talked about their experience removing a portion of the tumor and then either uh, observing or radiating the remainder in large glomus jugulari tumors. So this is my patient, um, you know, intraoperative view of that nice little cherry there in the middle ear that we plucked out and yep, sure enough, they got completely better. Um, so another case uh, here, oh no, sorry, this is the audiogram from that same case, um, managed not to clobber her hearing too much and she was very happy with her results. So another patient came to see me and said that she can hear it when my eyes are moving. Um, so that should be a, a pretty obvious tell to any neurotology fellow at this stage in your training, I would think. Um, they had those classic supranormal bone conduction thresholds there, uh, a small conductive or you want to call it a pseudo conductive hearing loss, um, positive Hennebert. And then if you put the 128 or 256 hertz tuning fork on their knee, they could hear it in their left ear. Um, lowered cervical vent threshold on the left side. So that's all pretty classic for superior canal dehiscence. And yeah, sure enough, there's the um, dehiscence on a scan. This is a case I did back in Cincinnati. Um, when I was there, I was mostly doing transmastoid plugging. So this is just some intraoperative photos uh, from that patient. So I would usually, my technique was to blue line down to the canal. So you can see a kind of arc of a blue line that I make there. And then just make a single opening into the labyrinth, use a fine dissector to make a little hole, and then quickly plug the canal with some fascia just to hopefully if I cross any sort of tear in the membranous labyrinth that that's going to seal that off fairly quickly, uh, reduce the odds of me causing some sort of toxic event in the inner ear. And then taking a mixture of bone pate with tissial. The tissial gives it a little bit more substance and allows you to push it into the lumen of the canal. And then I just sort of obliterate the entire perilabyrinthine space. Um, she said, I took away her superpowers post-op, so she didn't hear her eyes moving anymore. You can see those supernormal bone conduction responses are gone. But I did see this, this high frequency sensory neural loss, which after a while I started, um, you know, between that or patients having a little bit of dizziness after surgery, I um, mean, because you're, you're blocking off that canal. Um, when I don't tend to operate on a lot of people for vestibular symptoms with canal dehiscence, that's sort of my bias. I tend to offer surgery more to people who have auditory symptoms that I can make better. Um, 
the dizziness is just a little bit harder to promise in my uh, experience anyway. So I've started to do a transmastoid resurfacing procedure where basically just make a pocket over the superior semicircular canal and stuff some bone pate mixed with tisseal in there. Uh, and then also use some at the end to reconstruct the tegman defect. Um, six cases so far done this way. One intraop CSF leak that I repaired primarily. Um, really no one with significant dizziness postoperatively, so at least that's been successful. And I can just share a quick video of that uh, technique. So this is just putting some tisseal on some collected bone pate. Um, I use the Striker Bone Vac collector and then soak the, antibio uh, the bone chips in some levofloxacin solution. And then just creating this potential space, this little pocket very slowly. I don't always operate that slow. Well, maybe I usually operate that slowly, but I'm um, trying to go very slowly there just to lift the dura off of the dehiscence instead of scraping your instrument along the floor of the middle fossa where I might worry about stabbing it into the lumen. And then just taking small portions of bone pate mixed with tisseal and the tisseal gives it that substance so you can kind of grab it, smush it and push it around. And then just kind of cr slowly create and use the, almost the bone pate to dissect that pocket medially. So keep pushing it so I know I'm fully beyond the dehiscence, getting it past the labyrinth towards the petrous apex. And then, um, you know, just continuing to pack that in bit by bit until um, this whole perilabyrinthine space is once again uh, obliterated. Then I take um, some gel foam, protect the ossicles in the middle ear space from the bone pate, um, and then a large portion of bone pate plus tisseal is used to then cover uh, the tegment defect. Which we're showing in just a second here. So a little bit of fascia as well. I put the fascia temporarily over the opening into the antrum, lay down the uh, bone pate. And again, it's kind of all held together with some tisseal and then uh, lay the uh, fascia back down. Some gel foam again to protect the middle ear. I glue it all into place. So um, I've been pretty happy with the results. I did have one patient who got scanned postoperatively because she was having some headaches. And I was pretty happy with the amount of bone retention. This was a couple months after surgery. I have one patient with some longer term imaging. She didn't get a fine cut CT scan. Again, I don't have a great reason to scan these people other than academic interest. So I don't have a lot of scans, but um, I'm fairly happy with the bone retention and the coverage of the dehiscence that we can see in the postural and stem review. And then, um, you know, she has bilateral dehiscence. So <laughs> this is her, her right ear that I've corrected. Um, that video was of a different patient, uh, which I'll show in just a second. But, uh, you know, this is just a patient who I did her right ear and was pretty happy with that radiographically anyway. Um, this is that patient in the video. I actually just saw him today. This is his audiogram today. Um, so his left ear, you can see those low frequency thresholds improved a little bit. His supranormal bone conduction thresholds came down. He did have this high frequency loss preoperatively. I didn't cause that. So um, a couple more patients who, interestingly, this one also had a high frequency preop uh, loss where similarly we lose those supranormal bone conduction thresholds. The low frequency air conduction thresholds are pretty stable. Um, at least I'm happy I'm not inducing any new sensory neural loss. Another patient who had a left-sided um, resurfacing where it didn't completely eliminate, but at least have improved those supranormal thresholds and uh, no new high frequency sensory neural loss. So, so far so good with that technique. Um, that's been my preferred method. And then as far as how I manage sigmoid sinus resurfacing, I don't really do a whole lot to expose any more than the bare minimum, just so I can see the problem and very confidently get a layer of bone pate onto it. So here, that's that very deep purple. That's the true dehiscence there. There are several areas where there's very thin bone. You can see that light blue, but I don't go to the trouble of uncapping all of that just to get a wide and clear exposure. I just basically, once I find it, then I really cover it. So first with some just bone dust in that area, and then the whole thing just put a big blanket of bone pate. So bone pate is just the magic dust in my practice. I use it for cholesteatomas, these cases, canal dehiscence, almost everything. Um, this was my personal series when I finished at UC the, about three years ago now, uh, 11 patients where everyone uh, had unilateral surgery and nine out of 11 had complete resolution, partial resolution in the other two. Um, some patients, uh, one with superior semicircular canal dehiscence, intracranial hypertension and cephalocele had ongoing symptoms. So that's one thing also to point out to the patient is that 
I can't always say for sure that this is 100% of the source of your pulsatile tinnitus. There could be multiple things that are converging onto the same symptom. Um, no major complications. I did observe two in the hospital overnight for headache because I was a little afraid of, oh boy, did I cause a sigmoid sinus clot? So I, I did watch those people overnight if they had headache in the PACU. And this is just a CT scan of one of those patients who came in with a headache, um, just showing this is what I want to see. I want to see that good bone pate covering over the site of the dehiscence. Um, to kind of summarize um, the way I think about it, uh, this is maybe something you can kind of take a snapshot of and stud, uh, study later. But um, I think that there are a lot, there's a lot you can really differentiate in just the history and exam before you even get a CT scan that can really send you down um, one of these different pathways for causes of uh, pulsatile tinnitus. So the vascular dehiscence uh, patients compressing on the side of their neck or when they say they turn their head from side to side, if that silences their tinnitus, that strongly points me towards venous vascular dehiscences as their cause. Uh, middle ear tumors should be fairly obvious on exam, but they're also gonna have things like otalgia, otorrhea, bleeding, all that kind of stuff you just they don't see in any other type of uh, cause for pulsal tinnitus. Um, canal dehiscence we've talked about extensively and then intracranial hypertension. I'm asking all these patients about headache and vision loss. I'm sending most of them to an ophthalmologist to at least get fundoscopy. I'm not mandating they all get an LP, but um, you know, you'd, you'd certainly hear from wise and good surgeons who, who have a more aggressive intracranial hypertension workup whenever they feel like they identify those patients in their practice. Um, and then uh, dural AV fistulas are super rare to see in the otology world, but the neurosurgeons, they seem to see them all the time. So that's a, I feel like that's an interesting uh, field where our literature and training does not overlap very well with the literature and training of the neurosurgeons. Um, the thought of how they form is that there's something that causes a clot or obstruction in the sigmoid sinus or transverse sinus, and then the blood just has to find another way back to the heart. So it develops these new, can uh, um, new channels that eventually create connections between meningeal arteries and, um, and veins or meningeal arteries and um, the, the dural venous sinuses. Um, those can sometimes be auscultated. They'll be very evident on MRI, MRA, MRV, and then those patients are the ones who maybe I'm getting a, a catheter angiogram, sending them to the neurosurgeons for endovascular treatment. Um, I think we'll skip over this. There's there's quite a bit of um, debate over what's the first best scan to get. For me, it's become a CT scan, often with contrast. So if I can get one of those high resolution um, uh, temporal bone CT scans with contrast, I could show you one if we have some time. Um, I, I I find that that can help me figure out a lot. It can figure out canal dehiscence, all the vascular dehiscences. It could give me a hint towards different, you know, even like middle ear neoplasms and things like that. So I think that's, for me, that's the best first scan. Um, if patients say, I just want to make sure this isn't something that's going to kill me, maybe getting an MRI or MRA, MRV makes more sense. If they want you to fix it, though, a CT is probably the first best scan. That's my nutshell version of which scan to get. And um, yeah, I've got I've kind of towed into this slide a little bit, but... I think the most important things to ask the patient is, what does it sound like? Is it unilateral, bilateral? Is it constant? What makes it better or worse? This is all like classic medical school stuff of how to take a history, right? Um, a full ear exam, including microscopy and tuning forks. And then that neck compression, ear canal occlusion, interestingly, seems to like the people who, when you plug their ear canal, it makes it louder. Those are the, maybe the canal dehiscence patients. Uh, and then auscultate if you can, and then get an audiogram, of course. For patients who you have low suspicion of anything nefarious or just want reassurance, get an MRI. For patients where you're thinking about venous sources and you might want to offer surgery, a CT is probably first. And then, um, um, yeah, I wanted to take a couple minutes. I know we're, I want to kind of wrap up here, but just to talk about a couple of the things that we're researching here or things I want to um, investigate a little bit further here. Um, you know, we know about CT scans, CT angiograms, MR. Um, angio and venograms, and then catheter angiograms even that can look at dural venous sinus dynamics. But one thing um, that I wanted to look into in working with our uh, radiologists was that they have these amazing cine MRI scans. So you can catch 
you can uh, create these um, movies, which are actually made up of multiple different images over multiple different cardiac cycles. So they actually time the pictures they take to the patient's cardiac cycle with a you know pulse oximeter or an EKG, and then they can reconstruct things that move periodically with their heartbeat. So I thought, well, that might be interesting to see can we find that same phenomenon with the sigmoid sinus that Dr. Sismanis was talking about, this medial surface compression of the sigmoid sinus? And so, um, and yeah, so the inside of the dry skull here, you're going to see this free surface medially to uh, compress. And so we've taken a couple MR uh, scanner pictures, basically using those same protocols as for cardiac MRI, looking for wall movement here at the medial wall of the sigmoid sinus. This was just a healthy control. I thought we were able to see some motion. I'm not sure if that's that wall compressing in medially. Um, different protocols have been tried to try and see if we can image that. And basically the long story short is that I haven't been able to see that yet. So I didn't see anyone else who would look to see if they could substantiate that idea that it's actually the wall of the sinus that's compressing. Um, this patient has a huge sigmoid diverticulum here, but didn't really seem like there's any movement of the medial wall. And similarly for this patient who had just idiopathic pulsal tinnitus, maybe she had a small dural AV fistula around her orbit, uh, but I didn't see any movement of that int uh, that medial surface. So still looking to do this with more patients and, and learn a little bit more. Also trying to learn a little bit more about this from um, computational fluid dynamics. So um, I was uh, beaten to the punch a little bit by uh, Dr. Kesser and his group at Virginia. I'm not sure if anyone from there is, a, is on the call, but um, you know, talking about you know, computational fluid dynamics. So basically the same thing that engineers use to try and make a more aerodynamic race car. Well, you can simulate blood flowing through tubes. And so that seems like a great way to potentially learn a little bit more about this problem. And then finally, 40 flow MRI is another interesting um, way to potentially study flow. So it's using the fact that um, basically tricks in the MRI pulse sequences to capture moving objects. You can get uh, over the course of a cardiac cycle, you can get these three-dimensional vectors of blood movement through the sigmoid and transverse sinuses. So I think a lot of things that the otologist could potentially use to learn a little bit more about these patients are going to be um, forthcoming in the next few years. And I'll finally just end with a, a plug for wooshers.com. Um, I bet if you get mentioned on the wooshers.com forum, it'll probably boost your pulsatile tinnitus practice. Um, it's a patient support group for that particular symptom. So um, with that, I'll stop and maybe just uh, open it up to any questions if there are any out there. Joe, Ted Meyer, thanks for doing this. Yeah. You've been in several areas of the country now. What are you seeing in terms of, are there any differences of morbid obesity and those sort of chronic health issues leading to some of these problems in your patient population? Hmm. Yeah, I would say um, I see less um, sigmoid dehiscence and intracranial hypertension here compared to Cincinnati. Um, I'm not sure if there's a huge demographic BMI difference. I would say that um, we saw a little bit different patient population at Cincinnati, which was, you know, sort of the um, catch-all hospital uh, at University Hospital there, as opposed to Mayo Clinic. So there are a lot of differences that I probably can't completely disentangle. I would say more more obesity and more um, jugular uh, transverse sigmoid sinus abnormalities in Cincinnati than here if I had to guess. In Texas, it was funny, I went, I, I trained, you know, in residency, and I think our understanding of this problem has changed a bit in the last five, 10 years, but I finished residency in 2014, and I never saw a single patient where we diagnosed a sigmoid sinus dehiscence and treated it. And I went to fellowship in Texas, where you know, there's a decent size, uh, oversized population there, and Jeff Freybeck was telling me, oh, yeah, we just put more insulation on the pipe and the symptom goes away. I didn't believe him. I was like, yeah, right. That's not a thing. And so, um, yeah, I think it's just a, a, a lesson to keep an open mind uh, about about things you can treat. I never saw a patient there with it. I never treated anyone. But then I got to Cincinnati and started doing a fair amount of it. Yeah, we did not see much in my training residency or fellowship. And early on back then, people were going in the neck and tying off the mm -hmm. vein. Um, and 
much better ways to do things uh, now that we understand this a little better. And I am definitely going to get my partners on that wishers.com website <laughs> and get, get them more business. I think you can buy a t-shirt. <laughs> Hey, Joe, Rick no here. Hey, Rick. Enjoyed, enjoyed your talk. Obviously, I'm from the Indiana, the another obese capital of the United States. <laughs> See quite a few of these patients, too. Um, I, I think you're uh, spot on with uh, everything you said and how you treat it and the exam with that simple sort of neck compression. Um, interesting, a couple of patients I've seen when I do that, they don't have any response. And then I press on their mastoid and like their emissary vein and they, and it goes away and, you know, you can sort of feel this pulsing back there. And mm. interestingly, all, almost all those patients have dural AVFs. And so I think there's a, for the otology, neurotology exam sort of workup, I think that's one way to differentiate it is if you're, I was like, yeah, maybe I could do the emissary vein and then get rid of that. And I was like, wait a minute, that doesn't even make any sense. So did a, you know, sort of all the imaging work up and they have AVF. So um, oh. if it doesn't, that simple maneuver of compression on the jugular vein doesn't do it, then you got to look elsewhere. So, um, but yeah, I enjoyed your talk. Thanks a lot. Are your radiologist giving you a preferred protocol that they use to image those folks? Yeah, it's variable. Um, I would agree with you. I start with a CT if I compress the neck and I'm looking for a sigmoid wall abnormality. That's exactly what I do. I think they probably need some intracranial imaging. Obviously, we're most worried about their transverse sinus stenosis. And so either some say MRI with contrast gives you enough uh, imaging of this transverse, but I tend to get an MRV. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you there. Any other questions from the audience? I just want to clarify one thing, Dr. Breen. Um, I just had a quick question about the algorithm. I know a lot has come out recently um, about workup for these patients and what to choose first. And so if you have kind of in that low suspicion category, a patient that really nothing is coming up on physical exam, but they are reporting pulse style tinnitus, specifically I'm picturing some of our veteran population. Um, for that population, would it MRI, would that still be your first imaging that you would recommend or would you start with that CT with contrast even if nothing on the physical exam is really coming up suspicious? Yeah, I think um, like with the Dr. Lailson just said and uh, mm. kind of like a, my my approach is what is the patient wanting to get out of the uh, interaction? They just, if they're worried about it, if you're just trying to reassure them that it's nothing that's going to be dangerous, it's not a tumor, it's not a dural AV fistula, you know, that would be an MRI with contrast, probably maybe an MRV along with it. Um, you're not going to miss anything that is, um, you know, you'd even catch things like aneurysms and things like that, which maybe even would be incidental to their symptom, honestly. Um, but if that's all normal, I think you can fairly well reassure the patient. You might tell them, I can't fix you for sure. Um, but if you want to look for, if they are very distressed by the symptom, want any sort of intervention, um, probably getting a CT along with it. And, you know, I think. We used to worry so much more about like, well, what test would we get uh, or which ear do we implant or um, do we get an ABR or an MRI? It's like, well, now we just are, we're spoiled and we just get it all. You know, we, we get them both and uh, it tends to get covered. And maybe that's not the most judicious spending of healthcare dollars, but that's the practical answer in a lot of these situations. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you so much for your time. Um, just a reminder to everyone, this will be uploaded to YouTube. So if you want to review anything, and then um, I'm sure Dr. Breen will be happy to answer any other questions in the future if you have any. Thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Have a good night. Bye, everybody.